Today, we look at one of the more colorful characters of the Apollo era astronauts, Dick Gordon, who flew on Gemini 11 and Apollo 12. And to do this, we're talking to his daughter, Tracy Shoblom, who has just released a book called Apollo's Creed, Lessons I Learned from My Astronaut Dad. If you have any Dick Gordon stories, we'd love to hear them, so get in touch via our social media pages at Space and Things 1 on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook or via the contact form on our website. And if you want to help us out, please consider joining us over at patreon.com forward slash space and things. But right now, enjoy episode 127 of the Space and Things podcast. You're listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 127 of our podcast. Now, Emily, how was your early birthday celebrations at Disney World? It looked like you had a great time based on what you posted online. Yes. Uh, before anybody asks, my birthday is on February 19th, so it's a little ways from now, but we did celebrate early um, in Orlando this weekend because I, I love Disney. And yeah, we went to eat at the Contemporary Resort. I did not stay there because that resort is insanely expensive. So we, but we did eat there and visit there, which was awesome. And uh, it's really mid-century. It looks very Apollo-esque, so it's really cool. I think everybody should at least visit it to see what it looks like because it's it's kind of a historic landmark hotel. And then we went to Epcot the next day. I'm such a nerd. One of my favorite rides at Epcot is the Land. <laughs> Let me explain. It's like um, a, a botanical ride. Like it oh, goes nice. through a greenhouse. You know, it's really cool. And it's very relaxing. They call it the nap ride as a joke because it's very <laughs> relaxing, you know, and it's it's a boat ride. And we went to the restaurant that sort of rotates over the, the ride and it, it's the Garden Grill and it was awesome. I mean, it, we just we just had the best time. And then the next day we went to Disney Springs for a while. So definitely we we had a wonderful time. I can't wait to go myself in May. I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be awesome. You're going to have a great time. Yeah, yeah I'm, a, I'm a bit of a Disney fanatic, so you'll you'll love it. We forgot to mention last week about the live stream thing we did for the Cosmosphere. Yes, we need to discuss that. Absolutely. Yeah. The good people at the Cosmosphere, which is a wonderful museum in Hutchinson, Kansas, asked Emily and I to be part of this. If you find their podcast, which I'm sure you can find by searching Cosmosphere in your podcast platform, uh, there's now two episodes which feature Emily and me. Uh, we did a live event for them two weeks ago as this comes out. And that was great. There were some people in, at the Cosmosphere asking some questions and we talked about making a podcast and, and, and how we came into it. And then we did a bonus podcast episode with John Molnix, who volunteers for the Cosmosphere and also has a wonderful podcast called The Space Shot, which you should definitely check out. Uh, and, and John's going to come on at some point on here as well. And we spoke a little bit more about some of the things that are, are difficult with doing a podcast uh, and some things we enjoy, what we get out of it, what we've learnt, some of our favourite moments and so on and so forth. So if you want to go and check that out, that's a little bit different because we're kind of talking about us rather than space stuff which is a little bit different it felt different yeah it was it was fun though it was neat to do something a little different it was cool and john is wonderful as well yes he is awesome and i'd really just love to thank the cosmosphere for doing that you know i, I think that's so cool and i i really i'm embarrassed because um i did not get to see the museum because i got sick when i was there i do have delta credit so i'm hoping to visit it soon. Um, I'd like to go back and see what I, I missed because I know the museum is incredible. Yeah, I'm really honored that the Cosmosphere has asked us to talk about, you know, the making of a podcast. I think people are a little surprised that so much goes into it because people think, you know, oh, it's easy. Everybody has a podcast. I'm like, no, it, we take the whole process very seriously, you know, and, I, and not so serious that we're like, oh, yes, you know, very like, you know, formal like, <laughs> but we work hard to make sure, you know, you guys get really good interviews and, and guests and, and things like that. And I, I think today is no exception. We have a great show today, for example. So we absolutely do. I think people are a little, su not surprised, but I think people are like, wow, a lot of work goes into it. Like, yeah, it's not just, you know, <laughs> glamour and stuff like that. I don't know if we've ever been super glamorous, but, you know, it's not just what people see on the outside. 
There was that one time we got to dress up. Yes, we were glamorous <laughs> one time. Yes. One time. And we didn't even record. <laughs> yeah, we were glamorous that one time. It was pretty... Not so bad. Yeah, yeah a lot of work yeah, does yeah, go into yeah. it, but uh, you can find out more listening to that podcast. I will put links in the show notes, of course. So let's get on with this week's interview. Richard F. Gordon was selected by NASA to join the first group of astronauts in October 1963, following a career in the Navy in which he became a test pilot and won loads of awards and broke some records. He flew as the pilot of Gemini 11 alongside Pete Conrad, a flight which still holds the record for the highest apogee Earth orbit as they reached 851 miles high. Gordon performed two spacewalks on that mission as well, which often get forgotten about. He was then assigned to the backup crew for Apollo 9 as the command module pilot, also alongside Pete Conrad. And then they became the prime crew for Apollo 12, in which Gordon and Conrad were joined by Alan Bean. Of course, Apollo 12 is famous for being struck by lightning during the launch. And the crew were all best friends. Gordon was slated to be the commander of Apollo 18, which would have seen him walk on the moon but the Apollo program was cut short, so he retired from NASA and the Navy in January 1972. His post-NASA career saw him in a variety of roles across different industries. He was an absolute favorite for spaceflight fans at space events, and we miss him a lot since he died in November 2017. Today, we talked to his stepdaughter, Tracy Chablon. Tracy's mom was Richard's second wife, Linda, who died just two months before Dick in September 2017. Tracy has just released a book called Apollo's Creed, Lessons I Learned from My Astronaut Dad. So we figured it was a great week to have a chat about Dick Gordon, and fortunately, Tracy found time to talk to us. Roll the tape, Dave. I will, Dick. 10, 9, 8, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engines running. Commit. Liftoff. We have liftoff. 1122. So, Tracy, first of all, welcome and thank you for joining us. So, at Space and Things, we love a good scene setting question. So, at what point did you become aware that Dick Gordon was a, a record setting aviator and astronaut? And did that change your perception of him? That's a good question. Um, it was shortly after my mom met him, and I did not care. <laughs> I, all I knew is that he was some guy who was dating my mom and that distracted her enough so that she would leave me alone. So I didn't care. And then, <laughs> you know, other people thought it was cool. So, and then, you know, your kid, right? So people are like, no way. And this is before the internet. So I couldn't just Google it. So I'm sitting there <laughs> opening up the Encyclopedia Britannica going, this is him. And I'm like, sure. I'm like, okay, whatever. So it, it, it was not a big deal until other people started making it a big deal. I love that. I love those encyclopedias. And it's just crazy <laughs> that you had to use one of those. Back in the day, you're like. <laughs> there he is. There he is. Uh, so obviously in 1969, your father was the command module pilot for Apollo 12. One of the best loved Apollo missions. So what were Dick's favorite stories from the, that mission? Well, there was some, the, the funny thing is, is that the, there was a lot of stuff that I didn't know until I was an adult because <laughs> they were very racy. They were very um, wild that like as Apollo 11 was all serious and, you know, formal and we're going to the moon. You know, obviously Apollo 13 was scary and frightening. So Apollo 12, they were the Mavericks. They were the guys they were crazy. They had the need for speed. I mean, it's anybody who's going to play him in a movie, it would be Tom Cruise. So <laughs> as far as the stories go, he kept them age appropriate. So <laughs> when I was younger, they were, you know, sort of more wholesome. And but th then as I got older and I started to see him and Pete, mostly I was I was always a lot more calm and sedate and less party boyish. But boy, Pete and Bear were something. So he loved to, to sort of tell the stories of leading up to the space program and the crazy stuff that they used to do in the military and the pranks and things. But he also, he, he didn't like to talk. He didn't just sort of volunteer things. He answered what people asked, but to him, it was just something that he did. It was his job. 
And so he was very practical about it. He wasn't a bragger in any way. He literally was the guy that you could be standing next to at Costco and have no idea that you were standing next to a national hero. So he was a humble guy, didn't brag a lot. Um, and a lot of the stories that are in the book, uh, the stories of like the one that stands out the most to me that was I still think about on a regular basis is how he always would say that he would hold his thumb out, close his eye, and he could block off Earth. And this is when Pete and I were down on the lunar surface. And imagine, I mean, just imagine that like everybody you've ever met in your whole life, everybody who ever lived in on our planet, that dinosaur, just gone. Yeah. It's mind boggling. So that to me. All right. So another thing, unfortunately, astronaut families had to live with was the specter of risk. Now, in 1967, the Apollo 1 fire changed the program forever. And he also yes. lost his close friend, C.C. Williams, in a plane crash. Mm. Now, Williams would have been the lunar module pilot for Apollo 12, and the crew added a star to their mission patch in his honor. Did yes. Dick ever talk about these tragedies, and how do you think they affected him personally? He did not. Uh, not to me much. Um, but I think I think the way they, they affected him personally was in the sense that he became... He was very practical about it all. You know, he was like, yeah, we all knew. We all knew. And you obviously you hope it's not you, but it's what it's what you're prepared to do. So, for example, when the Challenger exploded and you know, I call him up, I was like, Bear, can't believe it. He goes, it's terrible. It's tragic. But, you know, everybody knows what you're getting into. Now, the hard part about it was the Krista McAuliffe part because she wasn't an astronaut. She was a teacher. Um, and I think that has a lot of implications for space tourism. Um, that people don't understand the inherent danger and risk. And that a uh, little bit that we did talk about space tourism, that was the biggest drawback to him in his mind was that was people, I mean, we don't even really fully grasp how dangerous a car is, let alone, you know, a spaceship. Mm. So while he didn't talk about those things to me, because he was kind of a closed lip sort of fellow, I think it just sort of inherently um, shaped his attitude about risk. He was not risk averse in a lot of ways um, because he's like, look, you know, there's inherent risk in everything. So let's talk about this new book you've written then, Apollo's Creed, which, yes. you know, as a Rocky fan, I'm a big fan of uh, of that as well. I like that little play on words there. So let's discuss some of the lessons that you did learn from your father. What might be your favorite lesson that you learned from him? Well, first of all, about the title. They wanted me to change the title. My editor <laughs> was like, we want you to change the title because when we do SEO, there's nothing there. I'm like, that's a good thing. Yeah. Okay. That's not a bad thing when people, you know, and yes, the, the Rocky character is still beloved, but that character was around 30 years ago. So I'm like, no, I'm not changing the title. But my favorite story from the book, and I swear to God, these really, these things really did happen. But my, my favorite thing was when he was teaching me how to drive. Okay. And I was not really good at receiving feedback. Um, it took me years to get there. And when he literally said to me, Racy, they've, they strapped my ass to a rocket ship, set it on fire, and it was struck by lightning twice. And teaching you to drive is the scariest thing I've ever done. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> He was funny. He was a funny guy. So that I mean, that's the thing. Like there were the, the the poignant ones, the profound ones. I think the main thing that I learned about him or from him was loyalty. Like the concept of and I didn't always execute that in my life, but this was a dedicated man. He was dedicated. When he committed to something, that was it. He was committed, hell or high water. And that was a really good character um, trait of his that um, I respect. Yeah, for me, the, the the friendship that he had with Pete and Al, the three of yeah. them. I mean, I, yeah. obviously, it's only stuff that I've read about. But when I visited Arlington to 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 visit uh, and pay my respects, seeing the three of them so close together, even even now, it made you realize this is this is legit. This is legit, isn't it? This this isn't. It's not something you just read about in a book and oh yeah they no. were good friends no they were good friends and and his loyalty to his friendship uh was, was was real right i love that i haven't been back since the funeral so i'm loving that you went there and saw it 
that's the thing. He, the, that, the sense of commitment and responsibility, you know, because I said to him, I was like, so, you know, when you're on the backside of the moon, were you scared? And he goes, well, maybe. I mean, if I thought about it, I would be scared. He goes, but really, I had a job to do. And for me, the biggest sense of responsibility was to get back so that I could pick them up. I mean, that's my language, not his. He had technical astronaut language. But <laughs> he's like, if I go flying off into oblivion, okay, that's bad for me. But if I don't get them back to their families, I'm responsible for their death and then their families for the rest of their lives. He goes, so it was my responsibility to get back. And then he also told how Pete was concerned about him when he was in his EVA and he was kind of going flying away. And they had this like work, you know, just cut, cut the guy loose if that happened. And they knew they couldn't do that. So it was their friendship was the foundation of, and that relationship was the foundation and the, sort of the theme of the mission, even though it was, you know, the job they had to do. Yeah, that's right. I almost forgot about that. He had to, he had to do an EVA on um, Gemini 11. It was kind of scary. No, it didn't go too well. You know, in, in the United States, in our space pro program, we were open with our errors and our mistakes and our learning curve. But even then, they hadn't found a way to really document it all. So the people who had been practicing the EVAs up until that point, they're like, oh, we need to be able to like tuck our feet onto something or whatever. So he didn't know. So he's out there and he's like clamping on with his legs, trying to hold on to the ship and he's sweating. And he was a sweater anyway. He used to sweat a lot and he was sweating and fogging up the thing. And then they had to just basically call it off because he was flying away. And, doing... and so he failed. He failed epically, publicly and humiliatingly at something that the whole world was watching. And it sure helped me as his daughter to understand people fail. We do. And it's embarrassing. And as a professor now, I talk about to my students about that walk of shame that we all have when we get fired and you're walking out with the box. And everybody's like, oh, look at it. But that's the thing. You can't get an ego about it. You, you try new things. And if you're trying something new, you might fail. And that's OK. Absolutely. And that's a great lesson to learn. Yes. Yeah. So many of us space buffs met Dick Gordon at events. I met him. Yeah. He was known as being probably one of the most gregarious and lovable. You know, he was one of the most approachable and, and humorous astronauts. You know, mm -hmm. I, I know personally, I just I just loved him. Like, I miss him. Uh, oh, he was good. wonderful. He was very sweet yeah. to me. He was a really wonderful guy. guy. Did he have sort of a more introspective side? Because I hate saying this. I didn't see it much. <laughs> well, no, because that's the thing. He was on. He was on, you know, Showtime. You know, the guy sitting at home and is, you know, with his hair messy, you know, drinking a beer and watching TV. Obviously, <laughs> you know, he, you're not on astronaut mode all the time. But boy, he knew he knew how to turn it on and be that charming. And the cool thing about him is because once you've succeeded at that level, right, and you've had parades and you've been to the White House and you've done all these things, you know, to use the acronym that the kids use these days, you know, you DJAF, you just don't, you know, you're like, OK. Like me, don't like me, too bad, already went to the moon. Like, so he was not impressed with the whole everything. He was just this funny, charming guy. And because of that, everybody loved him. And he was, he was really funny. Yeah, I, I'll just say again, I just loved him. I oh, I'm I so glad. I miss him every day. He's one of those guys that I think about just a lot. Many obituary stated, um, I think the New York Times said something like, you know, while he flew to the moon, he didn't quite reach the moon because he, he didn't walk on it. Get out, yeah. Which, of course, is incorrect because he orbited the moon. So he did reach the moon, you know. So do you think he ever regretted not, you know, walking on the moon? Oh, yeah. Always. Absolutely. I mean, how do you not regret that? That, you know, if you ask him, especially what was your biggest regret, he'd say that, of course. But he also, he was a totally practical guy. He understood. He understood that, you know, everybody had their order. So basically, he had hoped to get to the moon and like walk on it, didn't. But it, it helped that. Actually, I'm kind of glad for me because to be the second Apollo mission to the moon and then be the second guy that didn't get out. <laughs> He's literally the guy that everybody forgets about all the time. Like <laughs> I literally watched an entire Apollo series on some thing. They didn't even mention him. Okay. Al was like the host. They had pictures of him and Pete. I'm like, where's Richard? But because of that, he was able to teach me more about accepting what you can control. 
And that's really what everybody's lives are about is there's stuff that we all want real bad. You want that promotion. You want to get that person to love you. You want the new house. You want something and you're almost there and you get it and it looks like it's going to, it doesn't. So what are you going to do? Become a bitter jerk about it? No. You're like, look, that's the way the cookie crumbles. And at like towards the end of his life, when he said to me, when he had just turned 88 and he, you know, we knew he had cancer and my mom was already dead. And he was like, okay, maybe enough's enough. Like I've done, I, I you know, he wasn't knew he wasn't going to go back to the moon. He'd accomplished everything he was going to accomplish. I said to him, I was like, was it a good run? And he goes, all oh, right, it was good. It was good. He goes, I actually ended up doing everything I wanted to do. So in the end, he was able to be happy with what it was, but you know, was it disappointing? Of course, but that's what life is, right? We don't always get what we sound like Keith Richards, but we really don't always get what we want. <laughs> yeah, so. absolutely. So uh, obviously he just said he, he achieved everything he wanted to achieve and, and, beyond his NASA career as well. Obviously, he had his amazing yeah. aviation career before NASA, and afterwards, he had a crazy, crazy career. Did so many different things after he I left know. NASA. He was even, was he working for a football team at some point? Yeah, and yeah, he, New Orleans Saints. Yeah, I mean, he, he did a lot of things. So what do you think, or maybe you know, uh, what was the thing that he was most proud of from his work that he did? Was it Was it NASA or was it something else? Well, yeah, of course. It was NASA, of course. I mean, the other things that he did were meaningful. Like he started a company and all of the things that he did afterwards. But obviously, I mean, you don't go to the moon and then like have something else <laughs> going to be better than that. <laughs> There's really not much better than that to be like one of just a handful of people who actually went to the moon. Yeah, that's a good point. So let's take the NASA out. What do you think was the thing that he was most proud of? What made his eyes light up if you ask him a question about it? That's a good question. And, you know, to be honest, I think the answer would not be anything work related. Okay. I think he was a family man mm. and just watching his 10 million children and grandchildren grow and thrive and blossom. That really meant the world to him. He really loved his children. I didn't get to meet um, my stepbrother, Jimmy, but I the, one of the few times I actually saw him cry, obviously, was when Jimmy died. And I was like, what's wrong? And my mom told me. And he never, he had a really dark period after that. You don't, you don't really overcome that. Um, but I can, I if I were going to pause it, which I don't know the definitive answer to the question, um, but I, I would say after the moon, after NASA, he did some fun work-related things, but mostly it was just family at that point. Absolutely. Um, in closing, what would you like people to remember the most about Dick Gordon? Oh, that's a really good question. Mostly, I want them to remember him. Mm. I promised him at his funeral that I would help keep his legacy alive because, as I said, he's the forgotten guy. He's Michael Collins 2.0. And if you were to ask, go to a party and ask anybody who was the first man to walk on the moon, they can answer the question. They might even be able to answer who's the second first man to walk on the moon. He, <laughs> But if you say, well, who was the guy that went around the backside of the moon on the second? It, like not even the Jeopardy people. <laughs> so I want to change that. And not only do I want to change that, but I want people like you said, you loved him, Emily. He was great. He was funny. He was charming. He was brilliant. He was smart. He was good. He was down to earth. He is everything that we would want a national hero, an international hero to be. And that generation is dying out. I have a thing about cemeteries. I love them. I absolutely love me them. Too. And I'm stressed out about my own life. I go. So there's a cemetery just down the street from me. And I was parked and I was, you know, having some lunch and I was looking at the, the headstones. And I was, I was thinking about life and about death and how at some point, you know, we're all buried or whatever happens to us. And then our families are sad and they come. And then maybe if you're lucky, your grandkids come, right? I don't know where my grand, my great grandparents' cemetery places are. I have no idea. So my children might go, their children probably won't. Now, Arlington is a little different, but for the most of us, right? We live, we eat some food, we do some work, we fall in love, we do buy stuff, we die, we're planted in the ground somewhere in all likelihood. Then our families come, then they stop coming. And then eventually everybody forgets all about you and who you are and what that you ever really lived except for a DNA test. I don't want that to ever be the case with him. I don't want him to be some paragraph in a history book. 
I want to keep his memory alive because the values that he lived by are, they're timeless. And so that is what I wanted people to know is that here's this really good man who happened to have gone to the moon, but also is everybody's dad, right? Your dad and your dad, they'll do the dishes and clean your room and all that stuff. And why do you, you can't make me? The most extraordinary things in the world are accomplished by ordinary people, and we can't forget them. I got tears in my eyes. I'm saying this just from the bottom of my heart. I really loved him, and he was truly amazing. I, I, he's one of those guys I think about a lot still, even though he's been gone for Good. five years. I can't believe it. I, I just miss him. Like He was so... When you saw him at events, you were like, yes, he's here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yes. He was just fun. And he made he was one of those people you saw him smile and it automatically just the room just like lit. And everything was so, was, it was so generous. He was yes. so generous with his time and with his stories. And uh, the story in the book where he's reciting random Costco notes so I can have his autograph and sell. I'm like, I'm not selling your autograph. Yeah, he was such a good guy. I'm so glad that you loved him, Emily. I really am. He was amazing. Well, thank you very much for joining us to talk about about, about Dick. Pleasure. And also, yes, thank you. All the best with this book release. Uh, we hope it goes really well. Apollo's Creed, uh, lessons learned from my astronaut dad. I started reading yes. it today and I'm loving it. So uh, I, I need to start reading it. I would love to write something about it for my Please blog. Please do. I have a website, astronautdad.com. And if you have photos, I'm getting ready to put up a photo section where yes. uh, readers okay. and people like you can post your pictures with it. Amazing. Very cool. Okay, awesome. As that happens, we'll obviously let our listeners know as well. So uh, thank you very much, Tracy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. All right. That was just wonderful. Yeah, I have, I'm sitting here with this big smile on my face. Tracy is awesome, number one. She's awesome to talk to. And number two, um, I just, I love Dick Gordon so much. Like, just thinking about him, I get a big smile on my face because I was fortunate to meet him a few times, and, and I absolutely just adored him. He was awesome. Like, he was one of those guys, like, if you had met, if he had been the first Apollo astronaut you'd ever met, you would have not been disappointed, like, at all. Like, he was as awesome as you thought he was. Like she said, he was very on, like, you know, he was able to turn that on, if that makes sense. You know, sort of like the, yeah, I gotta be the cool astronaut. And um, he was very flirtatious, <laughs> but not in, like, a creepy way. I want to I wanna clarify that. I don't want people to think he was inappropriate. He was not. He was very flirtatious, but in that sort of, you know, charming, sort of Dean Martin 60s kind of way. He looked like a movie star. Like, he was so good looking. Like, it was like, I mean, even in his 80s, he still had that to him. Like, man, he looks like a movie star. Like, this is just nuts. Uh, my interactions with him were really positive. I do remember I went to an autograph show years ago. This was over 10 years ago. And I think I asked him, you know, so was the friendship between you guys, was that genuine? Because, you know, that's something that's always talked about. And I always wondered, you know, are they really that close? And he teared up. Like, you could see in his eyes, he got emotional. He's like, it was all real. We were basically like brothers from another mother. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, you could tell emotionally he really thought the world of these guys. I mean, they would have done anything for each other. And just that story of camaraderie. I think it is very special and unique to Apollo because I'm not sure, not to say the other crews didn't like each other. They did nothing like that. But I think nobody had, that they were, yeah, like the, they're the kind of guys I think they could look at each other and know what they were thinking type yeah. of thing. It was really yeah. special. And I mean, you could see in the paintings that Alan Bean did called the fantasy where they bring them with it. They bring them down with them, you know, for the last 60 miles. I just think that's wonderful. So I'm really glad this book is out. I, I haven't read this book yet. I think the lessons from Apollo astronauts 
and a few of them are still around and and they're still going strong but i think the lessons learned from them i mean we need this now yeah we got a taste of that in that interview for sure i really enjoyed that interview i thought i thought that was really really interesting i mean it it went places i didn't expect it to go it's one of the things with the fact that we only started this a couple of years ago is that there are definitely forgotten astronauts who we haven't covered because they were dead before we started doing this. Yeah. So there are astronauts which perhaps aren't known about by the general public who have died since we started this podcast where we've had the opportunity to celebrate yeah. them and hopefully bring their stories to some fresh ears. But there are astronauts who died before we started this where that's not been the case. And I'm really glad we've taken this opportunity to yeah. remember Dick Gordon, one of those command module pilots who often get overlooked. Michael Collins 2.0, as Tracy said. And Emily, you and I often call the Gemini program the most underrated program. But even within that, Gemini yeah. 11 is perhaps a forgotten mission. Yet it still holds a flying record which hasn't been matched 55 years on. And those spacewalks that Dick performed yeah. were essential to helping us understand what not to do while spacewalking. Yeah, the pictures from that mission are incredible. Yeah. I mean, they really, they're still amazing. And I mean, it's over, gosh, over 55 years later, which is frightening. But yeah, the pictures for that mission are incredible. And yeah, I totally agree with you. Nobody talks about Gemini, especially Gemini 11. That's not a mission that people bring up all the time. So it's cool that, you know, we are talking about him. Yeah. Uh, here's where I'm never, <laughs> I will never get a job or a, an article commissioned from the New York Times ever, probably because I'm about to crap on them, I think, for the second time in my <laughs> on this show. But um, there's an art, an obit on the New York Times, like Dick Gordon died, you know, when he died. Dick Gordon dies, didn't quite reach moon or, or something like that. The headline is reach for the moon, but didn't quite make it. And I'm like, wait a minute. He orbited the moon. OK, he didn't walk on it. You know, I'm sure he did regret that, but he did make it to the moon, which is pretty dang awesome. It's like going to the Grand Canyon and not going to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. But you've still seen the Grand Canyon and you've ex still experienced the Grand Canyon. You will still potentially have seen a sunrise or a sunset at the Grand Canyon. You just haven't been to the very bottom of it. Yeah. You don't say I've not been to the Grand Canyon. This is a bad comparison, but it's like I've been to the Disney Contemporary Resort, you know, but I've never <laughs> stayed there. Yeah. But going there and seeing it was still pretty nice. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I got to eat there. It wasn't bad. I had a great time. You know, I think it's like that almost like, you know, yeah. I didn't get to get to walk in its room, but I definitely got to see it. I have that memory. So it's not all was is bad. You know, yeah, it's just I didn't like that obituary when it was written because I was like, well, he did go to the moon. He just didn't walk on it. I think he regretted it, but I don't think it was like the end of his life. Like um, Tracy said in our interview, I think he had he recognized that he had a very fulfilling life despite that i guess my first real memory of dick gordon would be watching the last man on the moon documentary where he's one yes. of the people interviewed and there's a wonderful moment in that where he talks about something and he just gets a twinkle in his eye and he says something he knows is a bit risky and as he says it he kind of looks at the camera and wants to say am i allowed to say that but it with a smile on his face he's saying it like yeah, I just said that. <laughs> I already just, said it. It's such a great moment. Like his eyes tell such a story without him having to even say anything. Uh, and I think he's one of those people that obviously could communicate so well what he was feeling without necessarily saying saying it. But I, I'm very upset that I never got to meet him at one of the events because I think uh, anyone I know who's got Dick Gordon story has got a good Dick Gordon story. Yeah, he was awesome. I, you wouldn't have been disappointed. He was one of the great guys. I feel like they just made them different. You know, they really did. You know, I mean, I say that, but it's like a lot of those guys I met who are gone now, there was something different about them. You know, they were made a little tougher. And, and touching back on Tracy's book, I think they could take the hard times a little differently. So uh, obviously we, we've mentioned that uh, he was a award-winning 
aviator and a record-breaking aviator. So he won the Bendix Trophy race from Los Angeles to New York in May 1961, setting a new speed record of 869.74 miles per hour and a transcontinental record of two hours, 47 minutes at the time. So this is someone that, that was a high achiever, someone that did some pretty cool stuff. And that was before he joined NASA, obviously. Uh, and as I said, afterwards, you know, he, he his career afterwards was so varied it's great to read up on that as well if you ever find out about that so i'm really glad that tracy has written this book uh and that we, we get a chance to learn a few more lessons from from dick gordon yeah. uh, as always the full unedited interview will be on our patreon page patreon.com forward slash space and things and all the details you want about tracy about how you can find out about getting this book are in the show notes, which you can find on our website, spaceandthingspodcast.com. So, Emily, what's caught your eye in spaceflight this week? There's an article, I think it was by Kristen Fisher with CNN... Uh, Kristen Fisher of, of is not just a respected journalist in her own right, but she's also the daughter of Anna Fisher, Dr. Anna Fisher, I should say, the, the space shuttle astronaut. But uh, it's basically an article about who might be the first in the um, Artemis program to walk on the moon. And it's really cool because it's like, for the first time, we're seeing African-Americans and women, you know, sort mm-hmm. of like, okay, these might be the people who are selected for Artemis early this year, and it, it seems real now to me. It doesn't seem speculative almost anymore, you know, because first it was like, yeah, you know, women and African Americans will walk on the moon. That's cool. And I'm like, that's cool, but we haven't seen it yet. But now we're seeing these are the people who could be selected or or among the favorites to be selected, I guess. And I'm like, wow, it really seems it seems so real to me now that this is gonna be something that's actually going to happen. And I don't know. When I when I see a woman walk on the moon for the first time, I don't even know how I'm going to react at this point. Like, I'm probably just going to be, like, speechless for the first time in my life. I'll be, <laughs> I won't be saying anything, you know, but it, it's just going to be cool to see someone who looks more like me on the moon, you know, and, and I'm in my 40s now, you know, it'll be so, you know, I might be closer to 50 by the time a woman actually walks on the moon, but it's going to be awesome. Like, finally, we're there, you know? <laughs> Yeah, that's really what caught my eye this week was that article. NASA's starting to kind of think about, you know, it's it's Artemis Cruise and who they're going to put on it. So what about you, Dave? What have you been looking at this week? It's weird because since we stopped doing the news things, there's a few things that I feel like we don't talk about anymore. Meanwhile, on Mars used to be a favorite, favorite thing I used to always say. And and, uh, Perseverance has snagged its 10th sample and put that in a tube and ingenuity the helicopter has now done 41 flights yeah, yeah exactly yeah emily just pulled wow. a wide-eyed <laughs> face uh, as i said that you know because we're not flights because we don't report every week on exactly what's happened i think sometimes we can forget how mu- how quickly things are going on it feels like spacex every time i open my phone i do have a new notification that spacex has launched another another yes. rocket it, it you know they're yeah. launching almost every other day at the moment it seems rocket lab launched their first rocket in the us yeah from wallops island yep which is which is pretty cool japan launched this week i i just think we we're, we're missing out uh, from the news and every now and then I'm going to do that to say hey all these things have are oh, continuing to happen yeah there's uh, a lot happening there right is now. a lot happening right now the thing that has really caught my eye this week was a post in Space Hipsters from Mike Mullane astronaut Mike Mullane and I will post a link to it so you can read it within the show notes but essentially, he says, uh, the opening line is, I know this is a period of our space calendars of immense grief. And like the rest of you, I've been thinking of the crews and the families of those we lost. Of course, some of his close friends were lost as well. So uh, he really does mean that. But he points this out. And I think that this is really useful to remember because I think in January, we do focus on the negative stories and, and of our past and we pay our respects. And that's right to do that. But... This week, on the well, the 31st of January, 65 years ago, was the launch of Explorer 1, which was the US's first Earth satellite. 
and he, he's done a whole post just on Explorer One and what it was and why it was important and some of the other explorers. So it's a really, really good post. And just to remind us that other things happened in January, which were good news stories as well. Yeah. And also the anniversary of Apollo 14 is today, too. Absolutely. Which, Absolutely. which has been 52 years. How has it been that long? Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. 52 years. Yeah. And I think Mike also says, if any, if you're not even into space, he said he was a chick magnet in that post, too, or something. Something <laughs> like that. I don't know. I love Mike. It's really a trip to me that he posts in space hipsters because I remember reading Mike's book way before space hipsters was even around and i was just that book writing rockets is one of my favorites for many reasons but um i'm i'm just blown away that he actually posts at our group like he is such a cool guy um his post is really cool and i think he had a follow-up post today where he put a picture of himself when he was a chick magnet in the uh (laughs) he's poking fun at himself he put he puts a picture of his chick magnet self in the in the post so i was i was dying it was really funny he's a he's a hysterical guy that that bit was funny so obviously he talks about the uh international geophysical year and he said this yeah. afterwards if you can't immediately tell someone the meaning of igy you you have to hand in your space nerd badge right now <laughs> for your information yeah. in 1958 being able to rattle off what the igy was all about made you a real chick magnet in seventh grade <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Actually, I'm glad he knows what IGY is because I know this uh, as a as a space historian and puts on monocle and top hat, you know, as a space historian, it, a lot of people always say, oh, it's the space race and Sputnik started. I'm like, not really. It's actually the Interge- uh, International Geophysical Year was something that started this whole thing because and Europe was involved in it as well. It wasn't just the United States and Russia. Europe was involved in it, although they it wasn't as competitive between them and the Soviets and the United States. I think Europe's goals were a little different from ours and the Russians, obviously. But I'm really glad he did a post about that because IGY is something that everybody should know about what it did and why that was important at the time and what it what it yielded, I guess. So that is a really cool post. And, and the chick magnet thing, it just killed me. So, yeah, it was pretty funny. Yeah. And uh, there's another thing. That has caught my eye this week, and uh, that's our friend Bruce McCandless the third. Uh, what did he do? I discovered that he has a song, and and I feel like this may uh, oh this, yeah he this does may come up again this year as we reach to the fiftieth anniversary of a certain event. Uh, he has yeah. a Skylab. Song. I wonder what event that is. <laughs> He has a Skylab song and it's on his band camp and it's really good. I discovered his whole of his band camp back catalogue of songs and poetry and I have had a great time going through all of that. So uh, I will put a link to Bruce's uh, wonderful stuff, including his Skylab song, which which is, yeah, absolutely top notch and will definitely be spoke about again as we hit the 50th anniversary. And I'll put links to that in the show notes. So thanks very much for listening this week. We hope you enjoyed our look at Dick Gordon. Thanks also to those who recently joined our Patreon page. We've just hit over 50 subscribers on there. Awesome. Which is really great news. And I would really love to have 100. So if you're willing and able to help out, please head over there. Patreon.com forward slash space and things. And don't forget to share the podcast with your friends. If you know just one person who might listen then please send them our way. But don't forget, in space, no one can hear you mean. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.